right. Thank you, Coach. I appreciate you letting me uh, come on here and talk a little bit about uh, the stuff that I'm kind of passionate about. Uh, you know, it is nice to have uh, North Carolina represented, uh, North Carolina high school football represented on a, on a national scale. It's pretty cool. Uh, I want to go ahead and give a warning. This is uh, one of the first times I've ever led a virtual clinic. So uh, just excuse the hiccups and, and everything, but that's just part of the process and, and, and getting, getting better and, and learning how to do all this stuff. So uh, just bear with me if there's any technical difficulties or, or any type of typos or anything like that. Um, like coach was saying, uh, this is uh, my first year or uh, last year was my first year as the defensive coordinator at Eastern Guilford high school. Um, I got a call from a, a guy that I used to, Coach against, he's my head coach now, uh, Tony Aguilar. And uh, we coached against each other for about eight years in Alamance County, North Carolina. And uh, he was the offensive coordinator. And I was a, I was a, just an assistant linebackers coach. Um, and he saw my work and, and I appreciate him giving me the ability to, to come and work with him to try to uh, make uh, – already successful program, even more successful at Eastern Guilford. Um, a little bit of my background, uh, I grew up um, in Elon, it used to be Elon College, North Carolina. It's now Elon, North Carolina. Uh, same as the university, uh, if any of you guys are familiar with uh, the Elon Phoenix. Uh, I graduated from there in 2005, and then uh, I went to Appalachian State University, played football there um, until 2009. Uh, got to be part of the quote unquote golden years of Appalachian football. I think that their golden years are ahead of them. They're on a, they're on a great trajectory right now, um, headed up. And, uh, they, uh, I, I was a walk on there, uh, played four years of scout team defense. Uh, but even though I didn't get to get on the field too much, I think it taught me an amazing, uh, work ethic, uh, Jerry Moore, who's a legendary coach in his own right, uh, he was our head coach. He taught us so much. Just everything he said um, just seemed to stick to you. The one quote that uh, I'll try not to quote too many coaches today. I, I know that that can get kind of overbearing in a, in a culture talk. Um, but one thing that Coach Moore said that has made an impression on me, and I've, I've heard other app guys say the same thing, this exact same quote, is what are you willing to give up? for your team, that team first attitude, uh, the, the willingness to sacrifice something of your own in order to make the team better. Uh, and that's, that's stuck with me ever since he, he uh, gave us that. Uh, I went back, I, I was one of the few people uh, fortunate enough to find a teaching job when I got out of college in 2009. Uh, and it happened to be a my alma mater. Uh, Coach hired me as the linebackers coach, and uh, I stayed there at Western Alamance for about eight years. And over that time, I became uh, the special teams coordinator and video coordinator as well. Um, I moved in the summer of 2017 to Topsail High School down in Topsail, North Carolina. Um, and uh, they, they had, had an opening, and um, – just wanted to test the waters and, and get out and try something new, see a different part of the state, an opportunity to coach uh, a different position, uh, see, you know, different types of football. So uh, my wife and I, we, we prayed about it long and hard and decided to go down there. And then uh, in 2018, uh, like I said, Coach Aguilar offered me the job to, to come back here and uh, become defense coordinator at Eastern Guilford High School here in Guilford, uh, Greensboro, North Carolina. Oops. All right. Uh, so throughout that whole journey, um, you know, I started out as a young coach just trying to, as I'm sure, you know, a lot of you guys that are my age and older have done, you know, you start out and you feel like you're in over your head. And so you're just trying to process so much information and trying to read and, and go to all these clinics and, and listen to all these guys. And then, you're like, yeah, I can do that too. I can copy it. I can do it. And you, you get out there on your practice field Monday through Thursday, 
you know, and you got your you got your 14 to 18 year old guys, and it's just not clicking, and you're beating your head against the walls, and why aren't these guys understanding these things? Why aren't these guys understanding these things? And uh, my dad, who was also a coach um, when I was growing up, he was a football coach. Uh, he gave me some books. He he's a pastor now, and he gave me some books on leadership, and I started reading them. Uh, around 2013, 2014, and, and started just over the course of, from then until now, I've kind of shifted my uh, perspective on coaching, why I coach, what it's all about, and the process of, of not only creating a good team, but just creating good people uh, on our football teams. And these are some of the books and uh, things that have helped me uh, over that process, one of the first ones was uh, a book by Ken Blanchard, Lead Like Jesus. It simplified uh, the process of leadership. Uh, it, it wasn't like this mystic talking or anything like that. And, you know, for me, I'm a Christian, so the way that Jesus led, it, it's more personal for me. But the, still, the, the, even if you're not a Christian or you believe in something else, you can take those lessons that in, in leadership that Jesus had and other leaders had throughout different religions, throughout history. I'm a history teacher as well. You can look throughout all this stuff and they all had similar, um, similar uh, abilities and similar ways of creating a core of people around them that all wanted to carry that vision forward and help spread their message. So lead like Jesus helped me to realize that like being a leader is simple. It's not, it's not easy. It's simple. You just have to do these things. Then uh, a book, I'm sure everybody uh, that's ever heard any type of, you know, culture slash, you know, uh, team building lecture has heard, has heard John Gordon or heard of John Gordon. Um, you know, a lot of people have talked about the energy bus and stuff like that. But to me, one of the biggest books uh, that stood out or greatest books that stood out to me that he wrote uh, you went in the locker room first. He actually co-wrote it uh, with the Atlanta Falcons coach, Mike Smith. Um, it helped me uh, to see that you can, uh, you can take a bigger bit of responsibility for uh, what the team does, how they act, and you take control and you take ownership of the good and the bad. Uh, that they do in the process through that. It, it was a great book. It really changed my perspective on how I viewed my players um, and how I coached my players. Uh, it kind of opened my mind to uh, not blaming them and, and looking at myself and seeing how I could help to address their problems in different ways. Another one that's not necessarily a sports book or anything like that, The Advantage by Patrick Lencioni. Um, it's more business oriented, but it is talking about leadership and, and creating a business model that allows you to get behind uh, a set of values and use them as a rallying cry and allow people to still operate within your values, but under their own uh, personalities and styles and everything like that. And then finally, the, the, the thing I use the most is uh, it's a daily email by this guy, Brian Knight. Uh, and uh, sorry, Brian Kite, and it's called Daily Discipline, uh, and it's just short. takes thirty seconds to read every morning, and I it's, it's part of my daily routine. I, I get up and I'll do my devotion, and then I'll around six thirty or so he'll send that out, and I'll read that, and it just every time it just talks about doing the work. It's not just full of quotes or anything like that. It's just reminding you to constantly daily do the work. And, and that's what I'm going to try to get into with this. It's the process of actually doing the work. Those are some books that, uh, like I said, have, have influenced me throughout my journey and continue to influence me as I learn more. Um, the first thing, first thing when we talk about uh, creating, uh, you know, a good, great, team uh i hesitate to use the word culture because it's so overused now but just making a successful team it starts by building positive relationships and i'm going to say this at the very beginning i want to go ahead and get it out of the way just because i say positive 
does not mean by you, you guys saw the picture that got tweeted out of me shouting with long hair like uh, being positive does not mean you have to be happy go lucky calm all the time you know subdued if that's your personality by all means be that but if you're like the let's get up and let's go and let's fight somebody like that's what you know you can do that positively that that is you know that's all within the realm of positivity you can you can be positive even while you're chewing a kid out for making a mistake it's all it's all it can all be positive all right so i, I say all that now just so that we all understand uh when i say positive i'm not just saying happy go lucky poly poly uh, poly positivity and all that stuff. No, we're, we're, we're going to talk about a different type of positive. Okay. Starts with, so building positive relationships. Okay. So the first thing you've got to do is you've got to establish good relationships, positive relationships with these kids. Um, not just with the kids, but with the staff, everybody that you are coming into contact with and, 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 you know, from, from head coach, all the way down to assistant coach. If you're an assistant coach and you're just starting out, just control all this stuff. Take this down just to you and your guys, okay? Who are you in charge of, all right? If I'm the linebacker's coach, this is stuff that I can do with just my, you know, six linebackers that I've got with me, you know, on, on, you know, on Monday through Thursday. I'm going to apply all this. And then as you advance in your career, your, your group of people that you have influence over become bigger and bigger, but you get that practice right now working on this. So how do you do it? Well, with any type of relationship, you know, if you're talking to other coaches and stuff like that, any scheme, three, three stack, I'm a four, two, five guy, uh, you know, three, four, you know, the old five, two back in the day, you know, what type of coverage you want, cover three, cover four, we run man a lot, whatever, like any of that can work if that's what you want to do on the offensive side of the ball. You just look in the state of North Carolina, you got teams winning the state championship, you're in, you're out running the, running the, we're going to line up foot to foot and run triple option right down your throat. You can't stop it. You also got teams slinging the ball all over the place. They're winning state championships all the time. So it's not like one scheme is better than the other. What, what we're trying to find out here, and, and again, this isn't going to be a, a talk about scheme or anything like that. Whatever scheme you think is good for you and your team, go with that and stick with that and learn how to do that in the most efficient way possible, whether it's offense or defense, okay? That, you know, any of those schemes work. So now that we got the scheme talk out of the way, we'll keep going. The the winning programs, if you look at the at the, you know, the obviously the Nick Sabins, the Dabo Sweeney's, the PJ Flex, okay, all those guys, they achieve success, but they do it all in different ways. Okay. But what they do is if you talk to their players and you talk to the coaches, they all talk about how their head coach cares about them and is invested in what they do. Again, do they all do it the same way? Absolutely not. But they do all care genuinely about their kids and they're invested in them becoming good people. And you can also see that in the, gradua the graduation rates that they have and all that stuff. They're, they're genuinely interested about making these guys successful for the long term. And in high school, we're the same way. We should be the same way because we might have, you know, I know personally I've coached two guys that play at the Division One FBS level after coaching for 10 years. I've only had one or two do that. So a majority of my guys that I've coached have gone on either to college or the military service or into the workforce, and they're living their lives. and you see as time goes on, these people, these guys, these young guys, they start to become adults, they start to have families, they start to get married, and you see the men that they become. And that's when us having these positive relationships with these guys, you get to see the fruit of that. You know, maybe we won games, maybe we didn't. But what you did 
was you made these guys successful at life. And they're going to look back on when you were coaching them and use stuff that you taught them at that, you know, on a random Tuesday in September, they're going to remember and they're going to be like, Hey, you know, coach Mishner taught me that I shouldn't give up on, on this rep, you know, right here. I'm, I'm struggling, but I need to keep going. You know, that's what we're looking at for success. Um, embrace. And, and this was hard for me for a long time. Embrace the role of being a mentor in their lives. I, think of it this way. I'm a Star Wars guy. I like Star Wars. You're Yoda and they're Luke. A lot of people, and there's several books that are out about this. It's, it, it, if you look through stories, there's always some sort of mentor that helps the hero become the hero that, they, that everybody knows they can be, Okay. You look at Star Wars, Luke Skywalker, he, you know, just a random guy, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm on this planet with my aunt and uncle. And then all of a sudden he gets, you know, whisked away and he's, he's in, he's now, you know, fighting the Sith again, you know, he's a Jedi. I don't know how to be a Jedi. And then, you know, what happens? He goes and he spends time with Yoda and he becomes, you know, this great fighter, you know, you know, helps to fight against the Sith and, and save them, you know, save the galaxy and all that stuff. But what I'm saying is, even if you're not a Star Wars guy, embrace the role of being a mentor and, and allow these kids to think that they're the hero. When they think that they're the hero, they're going to try everything they can do to save you on the football field. doesn't matter what the scheme is. doesn't matter what the call. If they believe that you have uh, their best interest, they're going to fight tooth and nail for you to do whatever they can to be successful on the football field because you've invested in them and you've taught them, you've shown them the way, trust the force, you know, all that stuff. They now trust the force and they are fighting for you. Okay. So that I'll, I'll stop with the star Wars stuff. Now I'll keep going. The last thing to build in positive relationships is communication. Okay. Communicate, communicate, over communicate, over communicate, don't worry about communicating too much with them, okay? At least they know what you want them to do if you are talking to them. Uh, you know, I heard a great an analogy one time. It's like the communication is the bridge, all right, from point A to point B. If there's no communication, these, what's going to happen is the communication is going to fall. So you've got the two sides of communication here, point A, point B, all right? You've got the bridge. And then all of a sudden, if there is no communication, all that's going to fill up right in between point A and point B is negativity, assuming, and you know what happens when people assume, it, it's just going to all be bad. So be sure that you are constantly communicating with your coaches, with your parents, and with the players, all right? Uh, and we'll get into communication a little bit more right here, all right? First thing you got to do, you know, a lot of people will talk about what we got to do with players. I'm going to focus also with staff, okay? So be in constant communication with your staff and set up, again, not one system works. Whatever system works for you, set up some sort of communication so that the staff can communicate back with you and you can have a constant bead on how they feel about stuff. There's all types of uh, – insanely smart coaches out there that have, you know, ways of using Google Sheets and Microsoft Teams and, and all that stuff to be able to get guys to come together and, and talk about how they're feeling, not just about like on Friday nights and, and, and how they're feeling about the upcoming opponent that week, but, you know, also talk about during the off season, how they're feeling about stuff, you know, filling out forms and talking about how people are feeling are, are feel the direction of the program's going or needs to change communication goes both ways so you're you're communicating your vision and then you're getting feedback from your coaching staff another thing that communicating will do is it'll it'll get rid of the infighting that happens inevitably on any coaching staff usually the larger the coaching staff the more you have to worry about stuff like that because some people will feel like their voice is not being heard so you've got to allow and you've got to invest in those people that are just the volunteers that are just out there because, you know, they feel like they're trying to help their community out a little bit or the younger guys that just 
all they all they want to do is show up and coach and then leave. They don't understand any of the responsibilities. Communicate with them, help bring them along, okay? Allow for other coaches to be able to express their feelings in a safe in a safe space where they know that they can actually talk about it and and it won't fall on deaf ears. And doing all of this, guys, it sets the example for the athletes. You are showing these guys, these kids that yes, we communicate with each other and we're going to communicate with you. We expect you to communicate back with us because if we're not doing that as a coaching staff, we all know if we're not, if the kids will know if we don't believe 100% in what we're doing because if we don't do it, they're not going to do it. And that's the way, that's the way coaching is in any sport now. That's just, that's how it is. Okay. So it sets a great example regarding the communication with athletes, constant communication with athletes eliminates excuses. How many times, you know, I, I watched that guy uh, talking to the, the guy on Twitter and TikTok and everything that get, that's been going through those videos, showing all the different coaches and everything like that. I laughed so hard when he did the one uh, with the, you know, excuses kids make. You know, how many times have we, should, have, have we you know, had practice and early in the season before school starts and, and the kids are like, I didn't know we were having practice today. What do you mean you don't know? You know, we're like, well, let's take a step back. Did we communicate well enough for those kids? If we did communicate it well, then yeah, we have absolutely every right to get onto that kid. But if we weren't communicating that a time may have changed, is it really that kid's fault or is it our fault for not communicating that change to that kid? You know, that that's just a tiny example and it, it could go a whole lot of other ways too. But just when we're communicating with the kids, we're eliminating their ability to make an excuse not to do something. Again, by communicating with them, they feel like that they, they being the kids, they feel like you must, you must care about them. Hey, coach must care about me. Uh, he's talking to me about this stuff. He's letting me know this stuff. Is he annoying me with all of these texts and, and reminds and, and all this stuff? Yeah, he is, but at least I know that he wants me to be there on time, okay? So, yeah, you might annoy the kids, but it's a good type of annoyance. They, they know that you care and you want them to be there, okay? And again, falling back on that building the relationship, if they know that you genuinely care about them as a person, they won't mind that much that you're annoying the crap out of them to make sure that they're at practice on time or that time has changed or anything like that, all right? The next thing we're going to go to when we talk about communication, we're going to kind of hop back on to the staff side of things right now, establishing core values. Okay. When we establish core values uh, and, and some of y'all may be a part of a program that already has core values set. If you are, that's awesome. Uh, or you have like a motto that you live by that your program was founded on. That's awesome. Stick with that. Keep going with that because you've already kind of you're already kind of understanding that. Okay. Uh, if if you want to just do this for again, let's go back to saying you're you know you're the defensive line coach and you don't really have a lot of say yet and and you, you know you're kind of this is your first or second year coaching or something like that. Uh, just try this with your position group. Just establish some core values for your position group. Okay, some stuff that you can live by, some stuff that you can hang your hat on. This is what we're going to be. This is what we're going to do. And it's got to be unique to you. Okay, so going back, if you're the head coach, this is what's going to make you different from whatever your rival five minutes down the road is doing. Okay, this isn't about winning. This isn't about getting championships. Like everybody wants to get championships. What's going to set you apart so that you get those championships? That's what we're talking about when we're talking about core values. Okay, and that's why I said everybody wants to win conference. Everybody wants to make the playoffs. Everybody wants to win the state championship. So you can't really have that as your value. Is that is that a goal that you want to have? Absolutely, that that can be the goal. But the goals, what what you achieve, are a byproduct of these core values that you establish. Okay, these core values will also create clarity for you, um, and your if, you know and your coaching staff so that they can make decisions without necessarily having to come and talk to you about every little thing that they want to do. They can kind of check off these boxes and they can say, all right, does it, does it, 
mark off A, B, and C. Okay, it does, and it marks them all off. I can just move ahead with this. I know I don't have to talk to coach about this because we've already talked about establishing these values, okay? So let me, before I get put the cart before the horse, let me talk a little bit more about this. Okay, it, it, it's unique to your program. It's not just a mission statement. It needs to be simple. Less than four, I, I, honestly, three, I feel like, has always been the, the easiest thing whenever I've helped to come up with core values because you can just spit out one, two, three, boom. You don't have to think about anything else. Most kids, if you say, if you're over communicating this over and over and over and over and over, they're just going to be able to say it. It's just going to roll off their tongue. They won't even be knowing that they're saying it. And then one day it'll finally click and they're finally buying into it. You're kind of brainwashing them. If that three for me, I feel like is that magical number, but you definitely want to keep it less than four. Okay. Definitely no more than five. All right. No one will remember it if you get like, oh, the Ten Commandments of this, you know, not picking on anybody if y'all have like the Ten Commandments of the weight room and everything like that. I understand. Uh, or you have the Ten Commandments, whatever. Like, I just feel like with these core values, to be able to quickly make decisions and stream on everything, if you keep it to three, it's awesome. Okay. Uh, in order to do that, again, we're talking about, we're, we're eventually going to talk about buy-in, but this kind of, this builds into it here. Get your staff together. OK, and talk about these core values that you want. OK, if you're on a small staff, you might be able to get everybody together. If you have a larger staff, you might only be able to get those guys that are, you know, genuinely invested in the program. Head coaches, if these, you know, these coaches, you know, who I'm talking about are, are putting in just as much work as you are in regards to. Uh, helping out with the field maintenance or they're the coordinators and they're helping with your game plan and stuff like that. You're, you know, guys that are truly invested and, you know, not just guys that show up and then leave. Okay. If they want to be a part of that and you want them to be a part of that, that's absolutely fine. But you definitely want to hear what those guys that have invested a lot, what they have to say as well. Okay. So way, way who's, you know, who has been putting in more versus who hadn't been putting in as much. Everybody can kind of feed on or, or, or input what they think. Um, but at the end of the day, you all have to agree. Everybody that's in that group has to agree on three or four of these core values. And, and some people might put out, you know, they might sound like two different words, but they all, fall under one big, you know, umbrella word that you can kind of, you can kind of mesh them together and, and eliminate having too many words. Um, it might take one, two, three different meetings to do. Uh, it might take, uh, you know, over the course of several weeks and you guys continually meeting, this might take a whole off season for you guys to actually finally settle on something that you guys feel uh, fits your program and makes you and, and it's going to make you different than the the guys right down the road or, or or your rivals in the conference or anything like that. So what you're looking for is uniqueness, and what you're looking for is something that you, your staff, and your kids can hang their hat on, knowing that this is what makes us different than the other guys right down the road. Okay, um, let's move on to the next one. Uh, one of the one of the things that I like to uh, the process, one of these, I, I'm using this image right here. This is not my own by any means, but the process of like finding your core values, you know, set your expectations that you want, find some role models that you like, uh, and, and look at what they do, determine what makes them special. Uh, window down your list, make it, make it like I was saying, just make it one, two, three simple things and then have your final decisions and your input. If you're, again, if you're allowing people to have their say in it and they felt like, even if you don't go with what they say, if they felt like they had um, a voice and they actually could share their opinion, they're going to agree to all of this stuff in the end, okay? And again, um, if I'm going too fast or I'm just talking and, and rambling or anything like that, and you need me to clarify something, feel free to ask a question or uh, 
you know, stop me and, and, and I'd be happy to try to explain it a little bit more. All right. Let's see. All right. So keeping on with the establishing core values, simplify. This will help you to simplify the future decisions like I was alluding to earlier. Once you've established those core values, you can simplify those future decisions. Your coaches don't always have to come to you and say, hey, can we do this or can we do this? They can just kind of, you can check it off the list. You know, obviously if it's big stuff, they need to come and talk to you about it. But I'm talking about the little day-to-day -day things that, you know, sometimes a head coach or a coordinator can get tired of people asking, hey, can I do this? Or what do you think about this drill? Should I do this? Hey, man, if it checks off all, all three of our values, go for it. You don't even have to talk to me, okay? Um, and, again, this will also allow for you to mold a, a, a united identity that the staff can get around. If the staff is 100% on board with it, obviously the kids are going to see that the staff is on board with it, and they're going to be feeding off of that as well, okay? Finally, over-communicate those core values. So you just say them and 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 say them until the kids – they're getting sick and tired of it. They might make fun of you about it. Uh, I know when, when I first did it, when I was at Western Alamance, we, we came up with our core values and we would say them over and over and over and over. And actually it even melted into just one phrase that we had called positive response. The guy that I worked with, Greg Jones, he, he came up with this phrase. He just said, hey, positive response. And the kids would make fun of us until finally we were down. We had a big lead in the second round of the playoffs. We lose that lead and the kids come off the field. As soon as we lose that lead, and instead of hanging their heads, they go, hey, guys, positive response. And it took hold. And had we not just been saying it over and over and over and putting them in situations, forcing them to do that, it never would have happened. Over-communicate that stuff. The kids might get annoyed with it at first, but eventually it's going to set in, and they're going to be like, oh, this is what that means. This is the time to apply that. And then they just take off with it. Okay? Simplicity. You know, guys, I, I – I, you know, I'm just like you. I sit here and I listen to these offensive guys talk and I listen to these defensive guys talk. And I really like where the offensive, you know, especially in high school football, where offensive play calling is headed with trying to be faster is simplifying the, the play calls and, and simplifying everything like that. You know, defense, I think we're a little bit behind on that, but I think that we are getting there. And I love that because it's just proving simplicity wins, okay? Everything can look complex, and you might think it's complex from an outsider standpoint. The fan might think it's complex, but if you look at some of the best offenses in the state of North Carolina, they might be running four or five different plays, but they're out of different formations with different motions and stuff like that. So it's all window dressing, okay? Simplicity applies with uh, – with communication and core values as well. The simpler and easier it is to say what your core values are, the simpler and easier it is for them to remember them and then for them to apply them. Okay, like I was saying, we came up, we even went down from having our three core values to have a positive response. Positive response. Had those kids heard that, they automatically thought of everything else. Okay, so you communicate your simple standards, your core values, your team goals. You can also have them as your position identities. Some examples for me personally, mine is uh, as a coach, wherever I go, I'm going to, if I'm thinking about doing something, my core values as a coach and as a person is, is it going to make them positive? Is it going to make them confident? And is it going to make them best at the small things, small things being any tedious thing to be able to achieve success. All right. For the Eastern Guilford defense, three things right here, fly to the ball, finish every play, and have fun, okay? Those are three things that we do all the time. Yes, Coach, I see you. you got yes, a sir. <clears throat> yeah, I was just asked, Coach, uh, with this pandemic, what are a few strategies that you've utilized to communicate your, your team core values with your players? So what I've done, uh, we were already in the process of establishing our core values before the pandemic hit, so we had kind of already been talking to our kids about it. Uh, fly to the ball, finish every play, have fun for my defense. That, that's something that I said in practice almost every day. Fly to the ball, finish every play, have fun. Like that was something that I was going with. The fast, physical, smart, we were kind of honing in on that uh, throughout the beginning of the offseason at Eastern Guilford. 
and we had met as a staff several times, the coaches had, and we were, we were settling in on that. And so the stuff that we've been doing to utilize that, um, our head coach does a great job on remind, getting these kids, uh, first of all, getting them on it, and then second of all, just sending that stuff out all the time. We also use, uh, there, there's several different apps right now. Um, we, use, we use Rack. Uh, that helps us to, to get the workouts out to them. I think there's Team Builder also. Uh, I know also, um, you know, Remind isn't the only way to uh, communicate with the kids. Uh, I know depending on what your school, like who your school system's with, you can use Microsoft Teams or, or you can use uh, Zoom to be able to communicate with them. And all you're doing, guys, it's simple, just in conversation. You know, ours is fast, physical, smart, okay? Hey guys, we're, we're going to be fast, physical, and smart. And if we're, if we're going to be that, we've got to be confident in what we're doing. So that's why we're meeting right now. This is going to make us fast, physical, and smart. All right. And, and so as we're watching film, if I'm having a, a Zoom meeting with my linebackers, because I, I coach linebackers again now, if I'm having a Zoom meeting with my linebackers, we're, we're watching Huddle, I'm sharing my screen. Hey, you know, let's, let's check out this read. You know, what do we need to be doing? What's going to make us faster? How do we become faster? Like a, a, a big eye-opening thing for me is just, you know, from at, talking to other coaches, if they're talking to me saying, hey, I'd like to run, we, we, should, we should shift to doing this a little bit more. We should shift to doing that a little bit more. Or, or talking to kids, how can I do this? How can, I, how can you or how can we get better? Okay, so this process – of what are we going to do to get better? You know, that I kind of got lost in my thoughts there, but uh, what are we going to do to get better? What's the process that we're going to do to get better? Does it check off whatever that process is? So say, a, you know, a coach comes to me, hey coach, I'd like to, to change this, uh, the way that the line, the, the way the outside linebacker lines up right here, uh, we should line them up on the inside of number two. So that kind of takes away some of that stuff, or, or we should line them up on the outside so it takes away the RPO read real quick. Uh, well, does that make them fast? Does it make them more physical? Does it make them smarter? It checks off all three. Then, yeah, let's, let's explore that opportunity. Maybe it's a failure. That's fine. If it is, we'll drop back. We'll reassess. Same thing with the kids. You know, hey, coach, uh, you know, uh, what, do I need to, what do I need to be doing right now? Okay, well, let's think of things that's going to make you fast, physical, and smart, Okay. What can make you fast? Obviously, going and doing your workouts because it's all body weight stuff right now, so we're going to have some sprints in there for you. That's going to make you faster. The physicality part, just you getting out there and doing that workout, we all know how teenagers are right now. They all want to sleep all the time. They don't want to get on there and do their work. You have to be on them virtually about doing their stuff, okay? The physical part, just getting out there and doing your workout, that's going to help you down the road with the physical part. And the being smart part, guys, get on here with me on this Zoom part, and I will make you smart. I will make you football smart if you trust me right here, guys. And, again, if I've built that relationship and I've been building that relationship with my guys and with my players, they know that I'm not just wanting to win to promote Coach Michener. I want them to be successful. They're going to get on there, and they're going to, they're going to get on here, and they're going, to, they're going to learn, you know, and they're going to come to me with questions. So. I think that's a that's a big way that uh, you try to communicate that stuff. Again, I, I go back to the over communicating. If you just keep on saying it, keep on saying it, whatever way you can, whether it's on Twitter, whether it's you know on Remind, whether it's on you know you're texting them, or whether it's on Zoom, just always find a way to to kind of put that into the conversation, insert that into the conversation. That's I guess that's the answer the long answer to probably what should have been a shorter answer. Sorry about that coach. Um, you know, again, these are just examples. They're, they're, they're three easy things every time, fast, physical, smart, fly the ball, finish every play, have fun. Um, and for me personally, positive, confident, best at the small things. Okay. So we'll move on from there. All right. Creating this buy-in. All right, uh, and, and we've kind of alluded to it all along. If you're doing these things, if you're investing in the relationships and then becoming good people, great people, successful people, if you're communicating with them, if you're allowing them to be able to communicate with you and you're listening 
to their feedback. And I'm not, again, I'm not just talking about players. I'm talking about coaches. If we're doing that, they're going to buy in. It's, it might take a little bit of time, but they are going to buy in. Okay. So they will not buy in if you, if they don't feel like you're investing in what they have to say and what they are doing. Okay. Show up to other sports that those kids are doing, you know, invite those coaches, even some of them that might get on your nerves a little bit, invite those coaches over to your house, have a cookout. Don't even talk about football. Just hang out, have their families over. Show that you care. Okay. Because ultimately that's what we need to be doing. That's why we have these teams is so that we can help each other out. All right. Serve their heart, meaning get it, figure out what they're interested in. Get into what they're interested in. I'm not saying that you have to be best friends with everybody all the time, but, you know, people, if they feel like you are trying to get to know them, they will open up more and they will start to trust you more, okay? Um, again, and, and, and uh, all of us are coaching football because we had that one coach that we would have done anything for had they asked us to. My high school head coach, he was great at motivating us and getting us to believe that he knew what to do. And whenever he said to do it, we were going to do it. We didn't care how it was going to get done. It was going to get done. Um, he's a legendary coach in the state of North Carolina. And it's not just me that thinks that. There's all kinds of other, you know, players that played for him that feel the exact same way. He invested in the players. He got them to believe in what he was doing. And they all felt united together that they were fighting for something bigger than themselves. Okay. And the last part of this, with, or not the last part, but the last thing on this slide, hold them to, and I underline this for a reason, a consistently high standard. We all want to, everybody, there's not a single coach in America in any sport that doesn't want to hold their kids to high standards. The problem comes with, and the kids can figure this out very quickly, is consistency. Be consistent with them. If you set that standard, make it that standard and keep that standard. And it can be your first team all state guy, or it could be your third string guy. Keep that standard there, okay? Address it when they have problems. Praise them when they do great, all right? Players will respond to you if you are consistent. They might not like it at first, but if you're consistent, they are going to respond in the right way over time. Um, another big thing about buy-in, accepting responsibility for mistakes. There's, that's, I've seen it so many times, and I was guilty of it for so long, of placing the blame on, why isn't he doing that, you know? You, you, you know, I hear the excuse before, you know, you can coach him up, but you can't be out there with him. Well, if they're making the mistake on the field, guys, more than likely, unless they are just angry at you and purposely aren't doing what you coach them, which that's a whole different problem and a whole different bag of issues that we need to discuss. If they're not doing something consistently on the field, that's your fault as a coach. And let's say you're the defensive coordinator, but you're not coaching the secondary guys and they blow a coverage. Well, daggone it, that's the, that's the secondary coach's fault. No, it's not. It's your fault as a defensive coordinator for not communicating and not checking up with that guy to make sure he was doing it right, you know? When you start to look in the mirror and accept responsibility, and sometimes you might even accept the responsibility even when it isn't your fault. When you're accepting that responsibility, it's eliminating a lot of negative energy that you're going to be spending, that you would be spending like towards other people. And let's say you're falling on the sword for somebody. Well, that guy that made the mistake knows that he made the mistake, but you're not blaming him. Actually, you're taking the blame, okay? One of the best analogies that just pops in my head is when you have a great quarterback, okay, and I know I'm a defensive, I'm a defensive guy. I'm sitting here talking about a quarterback. The great quarterbacks, whenever their linemen make mistakes, the great quarterbacks aren't the, aren't the ones that are like yelling at their linemen. Like, why did you blow that? It's like, no, it's okay. You know, we'll get them next time. You, 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 you look at good offensive lines that have a good quarterback and they have a great relationship. 
it's because that quarterback knows that even if those guys make a mistake, he needs to eat that blame so that they don't get singled out, you know, and, and that's part of leadership. Sometimes you might have to fall on the sword and eat that negativity so that you're protecting other guys, but that will allow them to grow. That will allow them to buy into the vision that you have. This guy's willing to take the heat from me, even if it's not his fault necessarily. Like, I, I need to work harder for this guy. So that took a while, and I, it, it's, you know, I, I don't want you guys to think that I'm perfect by any means. I, I, it took me a, a long time to get to that point to stop pointing the finger at my players and start looking in the mirror and pointing it at myself. But when I started doing that, I started getting less stressed out by the kids, like the problems that they had on the field. I was, I just started looking at myself, Hey, what do I need to do to address this? And then I, I was, I was not spending as much time being angry at those kids. I was using that time to figure out what I needed to do to get better and what drills I needed to address what skills I needed to develop with those kids to make them better football players. And I think that my coaching game went up in regards to how I was able to communicate with kids after that, once I started looking and accepting the responsibility for myself. Man, time flies when you just talk on here. Didn't realize that. Um, okay, so again, I've already said this, you know, with the accountability, hold them to a high standard. But like I said at the very beginning, when I say positive guys, you don't have to be just like, oh, you know, we'll try hard next time. No, like get in their face if you need to. If you've done it, if you've done it the right way and you've invested in these kids and they know that they have a great positive relationship with you, don't be afraid to critique them and don't be afraid to hold them accountable, even if it's in front of their friends. You know, like the, the, there might be different situations here and there. And if you have been investing in these kids, you know how to address them differently, but still hold them all to the same standard. Okay. So don't be afraid to critique them and don't be afraid to hold them to a high standard. Be the first, uh, be the first to, to criticize, but also be the first and the loudest person to praise progress. When you see a guy make uh just progress. Let's say I'm not even talking about starters. Let's say I've been working on my, you know, my Mike linebacker to stop taking false steps, stop taking false steps, stop taking false steps. Or I'm talking about my three technique, get your man hand down. Don't put the wrong hand down. They finally do it. They finally take off. I'm running up behind that dude. I'm chest bumping him. I'm saying, yes, that's what I'm talking about. That's what we're talking about here. We actually have a system uh, at Eastern Guilford, where we reward those guys, uh, and we can actually take away some of of the uh, condition at the end of practice if they are making enough progress. And I'd be happy to explain that some other time. But we have a way to positively reinforce progress, and it allows us as coaches to show not just the starters, but those JV guys, those those guys that just came up from eighth grade and have never really played organized football before hey, you're making progress and you're helping the team out. This is great stuff, okay? So hold them to a high standard. But equally as important is when you criticize, be just as quick, if not quicker, to praise their progress, okay? Again, that'll get that buy-in going, all right? And the same can be said, again, for coaches too. This can, this can apply to your coaching staff. This will bring those coaches further along and feel like they have a bigger role and what they do, and they'll get more invested, and they'll get more bought in to what you're trying to do, okay? So finally, guys, um, with the summary, you know, just four quick things. Uh, build relationships by investing in the people. Establish your core values. Over-communicate your core values. And then create buy-in through consistency with responsibility, accountability, and praise for others. Okay. If you guys have any questions or anything like that, feel free to uh, hit me up on Twitter, DM me, uh, or you can email me too. What's up, Coach? You got a question? No, I was just uh, since you're wrapping up, uh, I was just gonna say if anybody, if anybody does have any questions, 
Um, obviously, drop them in the chat. We can take a you know a few right now, of course. Yeah, absolutely. And if not, and if not you know, coach has his information right there, and uh, you could definitely definitely follow up and ask uh, any other further stuff and, and and whatnot. I mean, you know, building that culture, man, that strong culture is so important. Uh, needs to be done. And coach and I were talking before how we both love these conversations because you know it's kind of universal. Like it doesn't just apply to football. You know what I mean? You can take it outside of that. So, uh, and that's always awesome. So whenever you get these talks that are in here, man, um, really powerful stuff. So definitely appreciate, uh, appreciate you for, for giving that talk coach for sure. Yeah, no problem. No problem at all. Uh, again, I'd, I'd be happy to talk to anybody at any time. Uh, reach out to me. Um, I'm always available to talk about this type of stuff. And I'm sure that I'll be reaching out to some of you guys as well in the future, and 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 because again, we're we're always learning. We're always learning. Uh, what was that, assistant coach? Oh, you see that? You you got a coach? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so, um, first of all, so it, the the question is, what advice would you give to an assistant coach in the building, or in building that culture, if your head coach is not at the same point? Um, you know, I, I've been, I have been in your shoes. Uh, what you want to do, um, and and just because you think that the head coach isn't at the same point doesn't mean that he's not. You just he might not be as good at, at communicating that stuff, and he might want that stuff. So think of it this way. Um, you know, there's there's you know, in John Gordon, he has he has these books you know, all, all these books. I, I don't know if you've ever heard of John Gordon before, but, you know, there's a book, there's one of his books where he talks about energy vampires. And what energy vampires do is they just, there's always, they always have some sort of comment, some sort of negativity that they, that, you know, oh yeah, it's, it's nice outside, but it's a little cloudy, you know, the weather's beautiful, but it's going to rain tomorrow. You know what I'm saying? Th those are energy vampires. Okay. The Eeyores of the bunch what you do with these guys, okay? You don't, you don't try to just run them out of town. You want to try to convert these people over. How do you convert these people over? Well, you, if you can find other people within your organization, and I know that there's other people in your organization that want this positivity to happen, and this could be your coach. Your coach wants this positivity to happen too, but just he hasn't woken up to it or anything. You surround that person with positivity and you open those lines of communication with them me personally i had a head coach in the past that was like that and we surrounded him me and several other coaches uh surrounded him with positivity all the time and we tried to help him if he felt like he had issues here or there we tried to be the first people to, to raise up and help him with those problems, eliminate those excuses, and then make him understand that, you know, I, you know for, for one of my coaches, he felt like he was always, you know, kind of victimized. So we tried to eliminate any of that and tried to prove not just to him but to everybody else how important he was. And as he started to feel that, you could see his demeanor change as a head coach, and you could see him become uh, more confident in what he was doing and being more comfortable in his role. And, I, you know, uh, another thing that I've always done is whenever I get these books, I don't keep them on my shelf. Like, I, I'd love to be able to hold them up here to you and everything, but I, I can't because I've given them to other people so that they can read them. So, you know, um, if you're not a big reader, I would suggest reading a John Gordon book or uh, following uh, that Brian Kite guy with the daily discipline. Um, you went in the locker room first really helps to understand uh, the role of positive coaching. Also, John Gordon has a book called The Power of Positive Team, where, again, it talks about positivity and all that stuff. I won't really I, – I, I hate for this to be a plug for, for <laughs> John Gordon books, but they're so great. and they're so easy to read because each chapter is like two pages. So you feel like you're flying through the book and they're only like 125 pages. So if I can read them, you can read them. It, 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 and, you know, Joey, I'd love to talk to you more about that type of stuff because I've been in your position before. So if that didn't make enough sense, I'd be glad to, to talk a little bit more sometime.
I definitely agree with you, Coach, man. Uh, those John Gordon books are, are – I, I tell people all the time, they're so powerful and yet so easy to read. It's like, it's like the perfect – perfect storm you know what I mean and uh yeah. it's awesome man there's a ton uh the hard hat is another good one yeah it's a great um, book you know winning the locker room first like you mentioned um and they're, they're awesome they're really awesome and um I definitely suggest and you know what like it's cool too because you know and there's certain things that you can do um and you can kind of I don't know like I, I think it's also a good idea like uh, you know uh our DC and I were talking and I think he ended up doing it, but you know, getting, getting a handful of them and, and having the kids read them, maybe a, a different position group, uh, yeah. you know, each week or so. Cause once again, it doesn't take that long to read. Yeah. So, um, it's, they, it, it's, they're, they're fantastic books. They're, they're really powerful stuff, man. And, uh, and also you know, if you're not, if you're not into, uh, if, if you're not into books, they also have podcasts. Oh uh, yeah. Brian, Brian kite. All podcast where he talks about discipline and doing the work john gordon has his positive university stuff he was just talking to pj fleck the other week and they they had been the university of minnesota he like their spring ball was actually they had like book clubs where they were reading the power of positive team and actually working through it together mm -hmm. uh, you know i know that's a college level i have also heard of like you know if you have like a leadership board with with your seniors or something like that on your team just going through that with them and teaching those guys to be leaders and letting that trickle down to the underclassmen. Absolutely. Uh, and, and kind of establishing it that way. Uh, we, we did some stuff kind of similar to that when we were at Western Alamance where we kind of had a leadership academy yep. uh, type thing. So no, that was a great, there's, def, there's all kinds of, I'm not the only guy that, that's about this. There's all kinds of successful coaches out there that are doing all types of different things. Again, like I said, the, the path to success has many roads up the mountain, and you just got to find whatever fits you personally in, in, your, in your journey and the people around you and fit those personalities together, and y'all go up it together one piece at a time. So. Absolutely. No, I agree, Coach. I, I love it, man. I appreciate that. And uh, you and I will definitely have some, some, some culture talks down the road for sure. Yeah, yeah absolutely. All right, coaches, uh, we'll wrap this one up. Once again, there's coaches' information. I, you know, obviously, you guys had uh, some time to, to write it down or copy it down. Uh, definitely follow up with them, man, if you guys have any questions um, or just want to chop it up with them. And, and this is what it's about, man, and, and, you know, the spreading of ideas and, and pushing each other to become uh, better coaches and, and, you know, constantly learning and growing, man. As long as we can continue to do that, um, you know, this culture will, will, will keep pressing forward, man. And that's the, that's the key. Cause, uh, at the end of the day, we go back to our kids and if we're better, we're gonna make our kids better. So I uh, appreciate all you guys tuning in, uh, for that. And then of course for coach, for giving the presentation, man. Thank you. Yeah, man. No problem.